What's up everybody? Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hey, I'm Sydney. Every single Thursday I sit down and I talk about the craziest true crime in every single state. The one that stuck out to me the most. So, if you like true crime, you should subscribe because I'm here for you every Thursday. Except for last week because last week was Thanksgiving. How was our Thanksgiving? Do we want Christmas to come as fast as possible and let this year end really fast because I know I do. I graduate in a little over two weeks and I'm super stoked. It's been stressful. It has been so, so stressful, but I'm ready and I'm super pumped for what this year has to bring um, or this next upcoming year because I'm finishing out this year graduating with a professional degree and I think that's really cool. So ready for my career to start actually in the criminal justice field. So I just think it's cool. I've had a really rough day today. So if I seem a little off, it's just been a day you know what I mean so I'm going to give a disclaimer I normally do on the really bad ones this one I always say this but this one is graphic okay mainly the story has so much graphics in it it's really hard to not add them in last week um yeah they did some horrible things but this week it talks about like what was actually wrong with the bodies and this is actually an unsolved serial killer. So I think that's really cool. Um, I haven't done an unsolved serial killer yet. I think unsolved type of murders or mysteries are so cool. And, oh, that's really bad. That's not what I mean. I just think they're interesting. Let me not say cool. I think they're really interesting, but this was kind of like a vintage um, type of story. It happened in the early 1900s. Since this was in the early 1900s, this is kind of targeted towards black women um, and African-American biracial women also. So I just wanna let that be a disclaimer because it isn't to be degrading in any type of way. It is just a story for educational purposes. I mean, absolutely no harm by any of the stories that I do, especially this one. So um, I don't want y'all thinking that I chose this specifically, but because it is an unsolved murder and it's one of the most known unsolved murders of Georgia. Um, I thought it was really interesting. It's such a good story. Yeah, it's really graphic and it does target um, African-American women. So I just want to let that be known. It was during the segregation time. So I will just stop blabbing my mouth and I will get in with today's story, which is the Atlanta Ripper. Still an unsolved mystery to this day. And yeah, just be aware for some really graphic details of the case. But without further ado, we'll just get into it. All right, so the Atlanta Ripper is a unsolved serial killer that took place in the early 1900s and it was in Atlanta, Georgia. This unidentified serial killer can thank his nickname or his or her, his or her nickname to Jack the Ripper, the one that terrorized London in the late 1880s. You know, the way he his style of killing was was pretty identical to Jack the Ripper, so he can thank his nickname for that. Between the years of 1911 and 1912, this serial killer took in about 20 victims. Very, very, very sad. He did target uh, black women. However, because it is unofficial um, evidence, there's no cases, it's really hard to say exactly when the murders first started taking place because it is possible that the Atlanta Ripper is Jack the Ripper of London. It's possible that this happened starting in the 1880s and moved to Atlanta, but the first beginning cases of Atlanta were in the 1911s. So start of uh, 1911 in January is whenever all the murders started to take place when 35 year old Rosa Treese was found completely mutilated on Gardner Street. Her head was completely smashed and her throat was slit from ear to ear. The perpetrator had drug her body about 75 yards away from her house. Nearly two hours after Rosa's body was found, the police arrested her husband, but he was released due to lack of evidence because of this. On February 19th, 1911, another woman was found. She was, un she was like an unknown woman. She was unidentified. She was found in the woods and her body was also completely mutilated. Her head was crushed. It's around 25 years old and it was said that she'd probably been laying there a day or two. So February 19th was not her actual death date, just the date that she was found. I'm gonna add in a quick side note. There are a lot of dates, a lot of dates in the story. So. I will put them and type them up so maybe y'all can keep up, but it's hard for me to keep up when I was reading this too. So back 
to what I was talking about. On May 28th of 1911, Mary Bell was found 25 yards away from her house and her throat was cut in a jagged way. It wasn't a clean cut. Mary Bell was found by her sister whenever her sister like kind of grew worried that she hadn't returned home from her night shift whenever she was a cook at this job that she had. And her sister came across her body and it hit the newspapers. I will put it here where they said that a black woman's body was found. June 15th, 1911, Addie Watts was found near a railroad and she, she kind of had it pretty bad. It showed that investigators believed that she was hit in the head with a brick and stabbed to death multiple times with a coupling pin or a coupling pin. Not entirely sure I say it, don't come for me, but a pin. She was stabbed over and over and over in the head with this pin and also her throat was slit from ear to ear as well. She was found in a shrub and where she was found was not where she was killed because there were drag marks. So whoever the killer was had drug her body um, away from where he actually killed her and tried to hide her in the shrubs. So the day after this murder, the Atlanta Journal came out with a headline basically explaining that the Jack the Ripper murders were kind of connected to what was going on based on the same style of killing. They believe the Jack the Ripper guy was the person who was responsible for all of these murders that were taking place and they named him the Black Butcher because of so far all of the women that were targeted were black women. On June 24th, 1911, Lizzie Watkins was found almost the exact same way that Addie was found, but it was just in a separate location. And then the Atlanta Journal that I had mentioned before came out with a article basically explaining they had a serial killer uh, that was loose in Atlanta. So in these reports is whenever it was said that the public was finding out that Jack the Ripper and the Atlanta Ripper were possibly the same person due to the same way they were killing people. The anatomy of the way they were killing and the way they were cutting in the same exact spots could prove that they were possibly the same person. So people started getting talk that the guy had transferred from London to Atlanta, but it is possible that it could be somebody else who just had a copycat killing and uh, the way Jack the Ripper killed people kind of made whoever want to do the exact same way. The only difference between these two killers was that Jack the Ripper did rape the bodies that he had killed and the Atlanta Ripper, there was no sexual um, assault evidence on the bodies whenever they were found. July 1st, 1911, Emma Lou Sharp came worried from her mother, Lena Sharp. Lena had went out to go get groceries for them and Lena never really returned after an hour or so. Emma Lou became a little worried and she, she knew everything that was going on. She knew all the killings and they were um, two black women. So she got nervous. She went over to the store and it was absolutely shocking and scary to find out that Lena even never made it to the store. Emma Lou freaked out. She left the store. She was gonna return home and maybe wait for her there. Maybe she had went to a different grocery store. And this is whenever she encountered who could possibly be the Atlanta Ripper. Emma explained that she had came across a very tall man who was black with very broad shoulders. He like approached her in a really weird way. She said that he was explaining like, you don't need to be afraid. I would never hurt girls like you. And it was just really off. The whole encounter was really weird. So it made her uncomfortable and she tried to move around him. And whenever she got around him, he stabbed her in the back. What saved her is she started frantically screaming and running during the neighborhood that she lived in. And all the neighbors started running out and whenever they went to go like confront this guy, he was completely gone. He had completely disappeared. But however, Lena, her mother was found and she was found dead. So this was possibly an encounter that Emma Lou had had with the person who had just murdered her mom. On July 8th, 1911, another encounter happened with what could possibly be the Atlanta Ripper. It was a tall black man with broad shoulders, a lady named Mary Yadel or Yadel. She explained that the only reason she possibly uh, came out alive with this situation is because the house that she was working at she ran out to the house completely screaming and it spooked the guy he went off and nobody was able to find him to confront him as well so this man was like really like good at hiding because it was almost immediately after she had seen him that she ran into the house and when he came out he was gone the next day on July 9th 
there was a pastor of a local church named Henry Proctor. He got all the community together and he said that we need all of the black community to come together so that we can find this guy because if what these ladies are saying are true, he is a member of our community. He is a black man and he is, you know, terrorizing all these women. So they got a meeting together, they had this meeting and it actually made shit hit the fan. There was so much segregation at this time that police were unwilling to work with black people and that's really sad and also still relevant to today. The police back then were so racist, again, relative today. But at this time, obviously it was way worse. But the black community had explained that if the police academy had hired somebody on that was a person of color who could be possibly be a detective that maybe this case would take a turn and it would help. The black community did not feel safe with the policemen that they had at the time. So it was, and plus this was in Georgia, this was the South, they did not really want to go to the police because nothing was really being done about this. It had been over six months and he had killed a few people and obviously nothing was being done. So the black community did not feel safe enough to have the police on their side. They believed that if there was a black detective, maybe things could get going because the, they would feel more comfortable talking to a black detective more than they would a white detective. On July 11th, a few days after this meeting had taken place, a man named Will Brogland was walking down his normal route that he took to work. And it was odd because he had seen some loose dirt on the ground and he didn't really understand it. And he took a little bit step closer. He found a blood trail, which led him to a body. Lady Holly was the body that he had discovered. Her throat was cut so deep that she was nearly decapitated. Her head was smashed and her body mutilated and she was also drugged like the other girls. She was like a few feet away from where she was killed. Her body was found kind of differently however because the shoes that she was wearing had been cut off of her feet, not her feet cut off. He just didn't take them off, he cut them off of her feet and had a comb that she had laying next to her hair and there was also a bloody rock laying next to her head which led investigators to believe that this was what he had smashed her skull with and that's really dark and really sad i'm so sorry but that's what investigators believe was the murder weapon you could you could say so it was really hard for police to get to the body because there was about a hundred people surrounding the body whenever news got out about this and before the coroner even arrived, it, the crowd had grew to about 500 people just crowding around this body to see who it was or just kind of get a glimpse of what the Atlanta Ripper did next. I don't know about you guys, but if I was told, hey, there's a body, I'm not gonna go out of my way to go look at it. I'm sorry, I think it's disrespectful, but at that time period, it wasn't just known that that was going on, that there was a lot of like killings. Props to whoever wants to do that, but not me. So that same day that Sadie's body was found, a man named Henry Huff was arrested due to people saying that he was the last person seen with Sadie. Also, whenever he was arrested, he had underwear that had blood stains on them. So they kind of thought that maybe this was Sadie's blood. Also, he had dirt all on his legs and scratches up and down his arm from maybe her trying to fight back and you know this was really suspicious so police arrested him there was a man named todd henderson that was arrested because apparently he was the last person seen with emma Lou, the one that i had mentioned earlier who got stabbed she survived he was arrested due to him being the last person that was possibly seen with emma Lou because they were at a drugstore together when emma Lou was brought into the police station they had um todd henderson speak so maybe that she could understand if that was the same voice she sat back and it was almost like blown away like yeah that's the guy she said if that isn't the guy that i am terribly mistaken because that that voice sounds so familiar that's him but whenever todd was interviewed he said that if he were to actually kill a person he would have killed his wife first because she gives him a lot of trouble I don't really think that's the best thing to say when you're being questioning about a murder. It's like, if I wanted to kill somebody, I would have killed my wife. Like, your wife's alive, so now we know that that's possibly something that you want to do. Stupid mistake, Todd. So obviously, police were thrown off by this statement and asked him, do you own anything? Possibly, like, a pocket knife or a razor or something that you could have done to have stabbed Emily. And he said that he had not owned a pocket knife or a razor in years. But it later found out that he was lying because he had went into the barber shop that same day to get his uh, straight blade razor sharpened. So 
he kind of screwed himself that way too. So both Todd and Henry were being held with the possibility that they were the murderers of Emily and Sadie. And on August 9th, Henry was indicted by a grand jury for um, the murder of Sadie. So another man became a suspect named John Daniel Huff. He was a suspect because on August 31st, okay, I don't have my retainer and I don't know why I'm having a lisp. On Daniel Huff became a new suspect because the Atlanta Ripper had captured another body. On August 31st, Mary Ann Duncan was found. Mary Ann was found in a railroad track and she was found with her body the exact same way the victims were. So despite all the rest and Henry's indictment, the police actually started to believe that maybe none of the people that we have captured right now are the real killers because all the people that we think actually killed people are in jail and this guy's still killing. So, you know. Good job, please. On October 22nd, Ava Florence was found and she, her body was found different. Ava did have a skull fracture, but her body would, or her neck was not cut, a clean cut to the throat like the other victims. She had a stab wound to her main jugular vein. It was just really different, very bloody mess. It was very crazy and it was just different. Like why would he change up the style of killing? Is this the same person or is this a new person? Minnie Wise was found dead in a alley on November 10th. Her head was beaten, her throat was cut, her body was dragged, and she was missing her right index finger and her shoes were um, also missing off of her feet. On November 21st, Mary Putnam's body was found possibly the worst out of all of the victims that I've mentioned so far. Just prepare yourself for this because this is disgusting. Her throat was cut, but her chest was cut open completely as if it was an autopsy and her heart was found laying next to her. So he had taken her heart out and like laid it next to her body. However, with this case, there was footprints that were found next to her body. And so the police got a bloodhound out to maybe track the scent. The bloodhound only tracked to about 200 yards away from the body and then he couldn't track the scent any longer. So. Don't know exactly how that happened, but they weren't ever able to do anything with this evidence. So an unnamed detective at this time explained that they needed to get the black community involved with this case because they thought that maybe the black community could help out a lot or they needed black community onto their team when it comes to detectives or police. And it was also explained that the detective that was unnamed thought that the black community knew exactly who it was, but they were so scared of police that they didn't want to say anything. and have you know repercussions against them because they were like a snitch or something i don't know this detective was kind of stupid it's like just go ahead and get them like let them know that you're on their side okay but you never know because people are racist so i'm not going to get into that but since this was a very segregated time it was very hard for again like i said police and the black community to work together so like i said earlier henry huff um around the ending of 1911 he was found not guilty at his trial. He, even though he was indicted for it, he was not guilty at this trial, which is awesome because I don't believe that he did it. But a very sexist sheriff got on the stand and explained that the black women are doing it to each other. There's no men involved. It's just black women jealous of other black women due to their husbands or boyfriends or whatever. So again, sheriff was not on the same side as the black women. Another newspaper article called the Atlanta Constitution explained that this whole thing was a myth. It's not Jack the Ripper. It's not a, a crazy serial killer. They were on the side that, yeah, it's the black women that are killing each other. I, I really don't think that, okay? And if you do think that, then you're gross. So January 19th of 1912, Pearl Williams was also found the exact same way all the other victims have been found. On April 8th, Mary Kate's body was found. She was found the exact same way, except the only thing was that her clothes were taken off her body and folded completely in a little neat pile next to her. Her body though was done completely clean cut, like almost as if it was a surgical instrument that had cut her open. Exactly a week later on April 15th, Another unidentified woman was um, found in the Chattahoochee River. So far, this was the youngest black woman that had been killed and she had a string tied really tightly around her neck with a key attached to it. It didn't say exactly if they figured out what the key was for or whatever it was, but it was cutting in so deep that it had like left like a scar on her. So it was really sad. That was the way her body was found was in this Chattahoochee River. 
Another unidentified woman was found um, in some shrubs just randomly. She had been stabbed in the throat. She was not uh, cut on the throat. She was stabbed. On May 11th, another unidentified black woman was found and she was found approximately dead for six hours at that point. So the killer had not gotten away that far, but it was still really sad because she was also stabbed in the throat exactly how the last victim was found. So I mentioned Ava Florence earlier. So she was killed in October of 1911. So August that next year of 1912, a man named Henry Brown was arrested for the murder of Ava Florence because Brown's wife said that he had come home late in the hours of the night and he had blood all over his clothing. And whenever he was arrested, he revealed details of other crimes that he had committed. During his trial, a man came forward and said that police had completely tied him down and beat him to the point that he confessed and that's why he confessed to these murders. Whenever Brown took the stand, or Henry Brown took the stand, he explained that he suffered like really bad from hallucinations and that's possibly why he also confessed was that the people were telling him to. So it was really hard to figure out what was going on and what was the truth in this case. However, the jury did acquit him, so. On February 11th, 1913, another body of an unidentified black woman was found on Christian Street. She was found the same ways that all the other victims had been found, but she suffered a um, cut to the face and her body was badly bruised. There were footprints that had surrounded her body and where her body was, there was a fresh marking next to it. So the investigators believed that the perpetrator had came back and flipped her body over to just verify that she was dead, that he had killed her. He had returned to the body, so maybe that could help him out, but it doesn't say if there was anything to help out with this, with this evidence. In March of 1913, Laura Smith was found and the body the same way of all the other women. And then a year later after that, firefighters were finding notes all over the city explaining that all of the black women were gonna get killed. So they believed that the Atlanta Ripper was starting up again because he didn't really kill anybody at the ending of 1912. It um, started kind of a few months, at the beginning of 1913. So a few years later on June 24th, 1917, there were two boys that had went early in the morning to go pick up some blackberries for their family and they came across a unidentified body. It was a black woman, her skull was crushed and again, her body was completely mutilated. October 1st, 1917, a group of children were walking by a campus and they found a body with her head completely crushed in a mud puddle. So of course they alerted police and police came out and she was um, another unidentified black woman. So a month later, a lady named Laura Blackwell was killed horrifically with multiple blows by an ax. Her body was found awful and parts of her body were burned and her clothes were burned in a pile next to her. But in March of 1918, a man named John Brown was convicted of her murder and he was sentenced to life in prison and he appealed to have another trial. And so his second trial, he was also convicted again of the exact same sentence. Around this time, there were also three other bodies that were found uh, burned and their clothes were burnt uh, next to them or some of them had partial burns. So it is possible that John had also done this to these women. So, but he was only convicted of the one because they didn't have any evidence to the other women. On April 20th, 1918, a 35 year old woman who was a black unidentified woman was found by a farmer. Her throat was cut, her body mutilated, and it was just like all the other victims at this point. On March 16th, 1919, a lady named Queen Esther Jackson was taking a sip of water from the hydrant outside of her house. She said that she had stepped into her yard a tall black man with broad shoulders stepped out and stabbed her multiple times. He disappeared into the darkness and when she was telling police this, um, she sadly passed away three days later in the hospital. September 5th, 1924, a body of a 17 year old unidentified black woman was found the same way all the other victims had been found. And then also three other unidentified black women were found at this time, the body the exact same way. So I've mentioned many, many, many people so between the years of 1910 and 1924, it is possible that there were multiple people killing people. Obviously there were some convicted, um, some husbands and some weren't, but it was just one of those things that Jack the Ripper kind of started in London that, that sparked people to want to kill the same way. That is 
you know, typical in a lot of cases where they kind of get a hint of what some people are doing and they like the way that they're killing people. So it is possible that the cases that were found cold were by one person, but it's highly likely that it was multiple people at this time. So like I said, Lucienda McNeil was found, she, whenever she was found at the beginning of 1911, her husband Charles was convicted of this because of a bloody razor that they found on him and he was also running away from police so he possibly tried to kill her the way that the Atlanta Ripper was killing people at this time it's possible it could have not been her husband it could have been the Atlanta Ripper but at the same time copycat killings that's what the police thought he was just trying to cover his tracks so in the case of Minnie Wise that I had mentioned earlier it is suspected that her husband had killed her because of the way that she was found. He possibly tried to do the same way that Charles had done to Lucienda. And it's really sad that these men were using a really traumatic serial killer that was like going around and killing all these people as a way to kill their wives because they didn't think they would get convicted. It was, it's crazy. But there was no evidence that he had done this, so there were no arrests made to Minnie Wise's husband. So in the case of Ida Ferguson, she was dating a guy named Lucky Elliot at the time, and he was very controlling of her, and he was convicted to life in prison for killing her, even though it was based solely on circumstantial evidence. The main thing was that his personal knife was bloody found next to her. I don't know. I don't know. This case is just crazy because there's possibly like so many people involved. So with Pearl Williams, she was also dating a guy, threatened that if she didn't marry him, that she would never be able to marry anybody. So, I mean, this kind of means like, if you don't marry me, like I'm gonna kill you and you won't be able to marry anybody. His name was Frank Harvey and he was arrested due to blood stains on his shirt and a bloody pocket knife. The following day, it is said that Edgar Evans was arrested for the murder of Pearl, but it didn't say if either men were convicted of this. It didn't say if either men went to trial. So not entirely sure if Pearl got her justice, but there are two suspects to that, which is Frank and Edgar. One of the victims that I didn't mention earlier, there was another victim named Alacy Owens. Her husband, Charlie, was convicted of killing her. Her husband, Charlie, had a hung jury in his first trial uh, for the conviction of killing her. And since it was a hung jury, he had a second trial and he was actually convicted for the murder of his wife, Alacy. So yes, there were some men convicted that possibly couldn't have been the killers. They possibly were just framed for it because they are the spouses, but it is also possible that they were doing copycat killings as well and thinking that they weren't gonna get convicted because of the serial killer and the timeline that had happened. So because a lot of these bodies were also found in shrubs near railroads or on railroad tracks, it is possible that whoever this killer was, was working for the railroad. Since many of these murders happened on the weekends, it is also said that the perpetrator was not a resident of Atlanta. Since he worked for the railroad, he only came in on weekends due to traveling by railroad and working in Atlanta on weekends. Also said that he possibly killed people in Atlanta and the unidentified bodies were the people that he had brought on the train with him and took them out and in Atlanta so they wouldn't be found in the city that they're actually from, you know? It would be hard for people to find them. So it is for certain that the motive between Jack the Ripper and the Atlanta Ripper was complete fear and hatred of women. It is really sad that black women were targeted because segregation was such a big deal at this time and there was so much hatred and racism at this time that that is why that they were targeted. A lot of the victims were also biracial so it is possible that he was prejudiced in this way. A lot of the crime scenes were really hard to pick up as evidence because of so many people going and trying to look at the body themselves that it messed up the crime scene. They couldn't get footprints or trackings or anything like that. There were multiple groups, it just disrupted the whole thing. They couldn't find any evidence. My personal opinion, I think that the police could have done so much more. I think that they were just scared, I guess, that if they tried to fame, like frame somebody who was tall and black that they could be called racist and they didn't really want to do that at that time. Even though it was a very racist time, which I mean, I think being racist at, their, at that time period was just known. So I don't know why they would fear feeling like they would be called out for racism, but it's really sad because none of these black women got their justice. It, I know for sure it would have been so much different if it was a white woman. Police would be on that case like hotcakes. Like, 
it's just really sad you know a lot of these people didn't get their justice this could have done so much more and i understand the point that a lot of the evidence have been uh disrupted by a lot of people coming and showing up to cases but i guess because atlanta is a big town i can't say it was a small town but atlanta is a big city and since it was the in the early 1900s there wasn't really a lot of ways that you could find evidence or I don't even know if fingerprints were there at that time. I should have looked that up. I don't know if fingerprints were a thing at this time, if they could figure out something like that. If I can, if all these detectives are sitting there saying that he knows anatomy very well, I would look at scientists or doctors. Like I would be like, okay, you know the, you know human anatomy very well. So let's go look at black doctors. These women who have experienced this, that have survived this, said that he was a tall black man. Let's go look for tall black doctors. Let's, let's figure it out. Let's see if we can get these victims in and match his face. You know, there's more that could have been done, but segregation. Nobody really cared about the black community at this time. So it's very, 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 very disgusting and sad. It is still to this day unsolved mysteries. There has been a lot of cold cases and a lot of victims that don't have justice. And I just, that doesn't really sit well with me. Let's be honest, that doesn't sit well with me. I don't like leaving people on cliffhangers. I don't really know how to end this, you know? I haven't done an unsolved one yet. I mean, technically, Arizona was unsolved. Technically. I really don't know what to say after that now because it was just all those poor, poor women. Their bodies are horribly mutilated, horribly, it's disgusting. That's it. That's it for today, everybody. I hope that y'all have a great week and if y'all have finals coming up or y'all are having finals this week, I hope that y'all are doing great with those finals. In this semester out with a bang, you guys, high school, if you're in college, in and out with a bang, let's do it, okay? We deserve it. That's why I have um, literal, I live in Louisiana, so I don't get to see this beautiful mess behind me, which is snowy trees. But a girl could dream, okay? I had this light up tree. I got a Hobby Lobby for like way too expensive because Hobby Lobby is expensive. But what am I even talking about now? Okay, <laughs> thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys have a great rest of your week and a great start to your next week. And I will see you guys next Thursday. All right, thank you so much. Bye.